This is a story long ago of a man, of a man who owned a, owned a little store. And I was my. Is, um, <clears throat> excited about this week because it's Daniel chapter 11. A lot of prophecy, a lot of Bible prophecy, and, and we're not, we don't certainly have time to go through every little bit of it in this chapter, but what I do want to share with you is somewhat extensive, so I want you to follow with me in your Bibles this morning as we look at Daniel chapter 11, continuing in our series in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11. I'm reading out of the NIV. You may have a different translation, and that's fine. But I will give you the verse number occasionally so you can keep up. Daniel chapter 11. It says, And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Here we see the history of the kings of the north and the south. In verse 2 it says, Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth. This fourth king that is arising is the Persian king Xerxes, who will be far richer than all the others. And when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise, and we know this is Alexander the Great, who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. And after he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted 
and given to others. And we know Alexander the Great's empire was divided among his four generals th who then contro controlled that Greek empire. Verse 5 says, the king of the south, and this, by the way, historically we know, is Ptolemy the first of Egypt, will become strong. One, but one of his commanders, a prince named Seleucus, will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of Ptolemy, that is, the daughter of the king of the south, will go to the king of the north to make an alliance. But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. And in verse 7, one from, her own, one from her family line will arise to take her place. He will atta attack the forces of the north, the king of the north, and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and will be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army which will sweep like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. In verse 11, Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army but will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first, and after several years he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. And this is recorded in a furious battle. It is Antiochus III. He took back the Holy Land from the dominion of the Ptolemies regime. And then in verse 14, we continue. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture and fortify the city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land, that is Israel, and will have the power to destroy it. And verse 17, he will determine to come with his might of his, of his entire kingdom, and he will make an alliance with the king of the south. This was fulfilled through Antiochus III, as he gave his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy V of Egypt. And as we continue, and he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Verse 18, then he will turn his attention to the coastlands, and he will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insol insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back towards the fortress of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. In verse 20, his successor, this is fulfilled in the brief reign of Seleucus III, will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or battle. We know historically that this man was assassinated. Verse 21, he will be succeeded by, the, by a contemptible person who is not given, the, given honor or royalty. And this man is the one that we all dread reading about, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully, and with only a few people he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, 
He will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor nor forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers, and he will plot to overthrow the fortress, but only for a time. Continuing in verse 25. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and, and courage against the king of the south. And the king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's, from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. <clears throat> the king of the north will return with his own, to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. In verse 29, at the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands, that would be the Roman Empire, will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his full, uh, his uh, fully, uh, I'm sorry, then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsook the Holy Covenant. And this is our focal voice, uh, verse this morning. I really want you to follow me with this one. In verse 31, his armed <coughs> forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, <clears throat> for many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may not be refined, purified, oh, I'm sorry, so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. Now, I appreciate you bearing with me as we read most of this chapter. I want to stop at that point. But I want you to get an idea here as we look at the historical account that Daniel received in this vision of future events that, by the way, Daniel never actually lived long enough to see come to pass. But he had this vision, and look at the detail that God gave Daniel in this vision about this king coming down and how this person was assassinated, and this one was overthrown, and then they drew back, and then they came in. I mean, it's amazing the detail that God gives us in this scripture. And not only gives us in this scripture, but as we look at the prophecies of Daniel, we know that this prophecy was fulfilled exactly as God laid out in this vision of Daniel some hundred and something years later. We see it all come to pass. We see kings rise up and fight back and forth and try to take over Israel and all these things exactly as God said in this chapter 11. And I want to draw your attention to this fact. If God gave us this vision, gave Daniel this vision for us, and we know that everything played out exactly, literally, like God said it would in the vision to Daniel, do we have any doubt at all that the rest of the visions and prophecy given to Daniel and in the Old Testament about the end times that are future to us today, do we have any doubt that they're not going to be literal, that they're not going to be played out exactly as God has laid out in Bible prophecy? I say amen to that. And you know, as I look, I say my God is very specific. My God says this is the way it's going to happen. These are the people who are going to be involved in it. And he even goes as far in some Bible prophecies to name individuals 150 years before they were ever born, he calls them out by name. That's the God we serve. And so today as we look at Daniel chapter 11 and we see these final verses that we, we're going to be uh, really scrutinizing and looking at closely, 
I want to, uh, to tell you that we need to understand that we have to make a decision in our lives whether we're going to serve self or whether we're going to sacrifice ourselves to God. Well, you've seen these people going around dressed in black. You've seen some of those in the malls, in the schools and all. Solid black they're dressed in. Some have chains hanging on them. Some have droopy clothing and painted purple hair and, and skin tones like the walking dead. You all seen those folks, right? Well, oftentimes our first thought about people wearing such attire is that they're into some kind of satanic stuff. <clears throat> that may or may not be the case at all. But they are focused on themselves. Most people have an attitude like Nebuchadnezzar. What was that in the first chapters of Daniel? It's all about me. Look at me. It's all about me and what I want and what I need. Who's going to give me what I want and who's going to supply me with what I need? But what I want to draw your attention to is that the devil knows that if he can't get you to be satanic, then he'll do his best to get you to be selfish. Throughout the Bible, God allows people to make their own choices. We see it over and over, played out in many Bible characters. And, and frankly, people like Abraham and Moses and Isaiah and others, we look at their lives and we say, wow, look, at they messed up really bad here. I mean, think about Abraham and all the trouble he got himself into. Amen? So we can choose to serve ourselves or we can choose to serve the living God. What many people don't understand is if you're not willing to serve God in comfortable times, you most likely won't serve God when times get tough. In verse 31 and 32 of this chapter in Daniel 11, we see the continuing story, continuing story of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, his persecution of God's people in Israel. And we see the people of God firmly resisting the enemies of God. Folks, today we are the people of God and we need to continue to stand as people of God and stand against what is evil. We did that at the polls when you went to vote this time for a president. And I'm going to tell you, that was wonderful. But, you know, we go into a secret little booth and nobody knows how we're voting. Amen? But when we come out of that booth, we don't, and I'm not talking about who you voted for, but I'm talking about voicing and proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ in this world because He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the ultimate president that we want. Amen? And much more. Let me draw, redraw your attention to Daniel 11, verses 31 and 32. Look there, please, with me. It says, His armed forces will rise up. This is Antiochus will rise up to desecrate, desecrate the temple fortress and they will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. <clears throat> you remember in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist and Antiochus IV Epiphanes is an image of the future Antichrist to come. He's not as bad, but he is bad. And this we see... In the book of Revelation, the Antichrist comes in. He desecrates the temple that has been rebuilt. And Antiochus comes in and he sets up an image of Zeus in the holy temple and eventually later sacrifices a pig on the altar. With flattery, it says, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Amen. In order to miss the purpose God has for your life. The enemy doesn't have to tempt you to be satanic. He doesn't have to get you to do a lot of evil things. He only has to entice you to be selfish, like Nebuchadnezzar. It's all about me. Now we see this in little toddlers. We see it in children. From the time they're born, it's all about them. They come out screaming, feed me, feed me. And as they get bigger, it's mine, it's mine. I want, I want. And you know, Sometimes, as adults, we haven't changed an awful lot. Selfishness will cause us to miss our life's calling with God. A life of sacrificial living and giving. Notice I said living, living out the gospel, the truth of God's word in our lives. And giving. Because if we are a people of God, we will be a people of the book. 
And the book says that God's people are givers. Amen? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says there, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Listen and see if this doesn't sound like our day. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we see there, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, in light of what God has done through Christ for us, to offer yourselves, your bodies, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is, your, I like what the King James says, it says it's just your reasonable act of worship. It's only reasonable for you to give your life to Christ considering he gave his life for you. And verse 2 goes on to say, and do not conform. Can I get an amen? amen? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that is through the word of God. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. I'm telling you, it, it amazes me how today the Christian community has compromised. Amen? We compromise so often. I hear young Christians who think abortion is okay. Well, you know, as they say, well, you know, certainly, some would say certainly it's not okay. And then you get in, well, what if the life of the mother is on the line. What about someone who has been raped? What about incest? And I'm going to tell you, I can't answer all of these scenarios because then what we get into is a religion called situational ethics. And it's ethics or situ religion based on, well, it's okay if, or that's okay if. I have to go with what God says. And God says we should not kill the unborn. We should not kill the unborn. Somebody said, well, my daughter was raped by a, a, a serial killer, if you will. Let me use that example to make it extreme. And now she has a baby, and, and we're trying to decide whether to abort that baby. or, or to, what, what are we going to do? I'm going to tell you, that baby hadn't done nothing against anybody in this world. And whether it's a serial killer or something worse, I'm just going to have to tell you if it's my daughter, I'm thinking... My daughter, do we have the right because of some bad situation to take a child's life? I say no. I say no. I say, well, what if it's about the case? Well, we don't know if the mother will survive the, the delivery. I don't know. I'm telling you, what I do is I get on my face before God and say, God, would you intervene? Will you help? And whether God does it my way or does it some other way, at least I know I've come to God and asked for his direction in the situation. I know those are hard choices. I know those are impossible situations for us to try to deal with. I recognize that. But when we are standing for God, we cannot compromise what the Word of God says, and there's a thing called life that he cherishes. The enemy's always trying to get you to avoid God's calling on your life. You know, Satan can't have you now. Before you came to Christ, you were Satan's child, the Bible says. Your father was the devil. And he already had you. He was taking you to hell at some point in time when you die. But now that you're a Christian, your father is God, our heavenly father. Amen. And Satan does not have a claim on you any longer. But it does not mean that he doesn't want to mess you up so you can't be productive for the kingdom of God. Even though you're a child of God, our culture wants you to buy into the modern day Babylonian mentality that says, it's all about me. I want you to notice that our culture says, don't do anything that makes you have to wait. Oh, we don't like to wait. 
You know, I, I came through Gulfport the other night coming back from um, a road trip, and um, we stopped at McDonald's. It was about 4.30 or 5. I mean, I figured it was going to be a little busy. I sat in my truck in the drive through lane for half an hour waiting on fast food. There's something wrong with this picture. I, I kept saying, you know, I got, a, I got a notion just to get out of this line. Even though I've ordered, the guy came out and took our order, you know, and we didn't have to wait till I got the little box and talked to it. But he came out and took the order, and I'm thinking, I, I, this is ridiculous. I mean, I saw people pulling out of the line, leaving after a while. Half an hour we waited in the line. And I'm thinking, you know, what I need to do is just chill out here. I said, I'm going to get a hamburger in a little while. It couldn't take that long, fast food, right? Couldn't take that long. But we're, we are geared, the world has geared us that we don't want to wait. Now, we know that's true with kids. We know it's true with unbelievers. But listen, Christians, as believers, God wants us to be able to wait sometimes. I know the Old Testament in Isaiah says, Wait upon the Lord, amen? And we've got to learn to be waiters or patient. Look at James when he talks about all of these things and how we grow and endure in patient, with patience. And nobody likes to pray for patience, do we? No, because we want it now, right? We don't want to wait. We've already been indoctrinated to some degree from the Babylonian mentality. We don't want to wait on anything. How about when we pray? And we ask God, Heavenly Father, you know, I'm, I'm praying about this situation in, our, in my life. And, and Father, I'm not hearing from you. And, you know, I've been praying for six weeks. I knew a lady one time. She prayed for her husband to become a Christian. She prayed for him for 20 years. Every Sunday morning, she got up and laid his clothes out on the bed. And he just walked by him. 20 years she prayed for him and every morning, every Sunday morning, put his clothes out on the bed for church. One Sunday morning, he put them on. And he went to church that day and he met Jesus. And he's an, he's an evangelist, revivalist guy now. I don't know if he's still preaching. He's probably 85 years old, but I'm sure he's still witnessing. Amen. But you see, sometimes we've got to just wait on God. We don't know God's timing, and God doesn't force people to come to Him. But He won't just turn them loose. He's going to keep at them, keep at them. Keep. And she kept at Him, didn't she? She was, is such a fine example of waiting on God. And, and just like the Bible talks about the woman that went before the judge over and over and just kept pleading and pleading, and finally He said, okay. He just wanted her out of there, Amen. God sometimes is waiting. Listen, do you realize that your prayer, the sincere, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? It has a lot of weight with God. And I just can't help believe that God's plan here on the earth involves you and me, and it involves us petitioning God. And sometimes I believe that God's sitting there waiting. He says, I'm waiting for you to get serious about your prayers here. I'm waiting. Say, so you're praying and wanting to know, wanting direction. Well, I'm waiting for you to shed a little tear. I'm waiting for you to, sh so to get some agony and some, some work up in this prayer. Not because it's emotional, but because I see your sincerity and I see your persistence and I see you enduring in that. <clears throat> and God says, I want you to, I, I'm waiting and I want to teach you to wait. There are times when God wants us to wait, to have patience and wait on Him. You know, it's His plan. But oftentimes we don't. We want short spurts of fast ministry. We want, we want to learn how to play the, an instrument for the praise team. We want to do it this month. We want to learn how to play guitar. We want to learn how to play the keyboard. And we want to get it. We know we need a keyboard. So God, teach me how to do this and do it now. Well, I'm going to tell you, I think, um, I think what God does is he says, yes, I want you to play the keyboard, or yes, I want you to teach Sunday school, or yes, I want you to work with this ministry. <clears throat> but we're going to start on the first step. We're going to start on page one. 
And first of all, you're going to get involved. Find out what the ministry is. Find out how to play the instrument. Find out what a teacher needs to know. And then you work with me and God, God has his hand on you. He will bring you to a point to use you in ministry. Unlike the young man some years ago that came to me and he said, Brother Stan, he said, God called me to preach. I said, when did this happen? He said, yesterday. And uh, he implied through our conversation that he expected me to let him come preach in the pulpit that Sunday. Now, this young man of about 20 years old, I'm sure, had a sincere heart. And I'm going to tell you, I can't say for sure, but I don't have any doubt that God called him to preach. But we have to learn to wait for God's timing, not for just for his calling. And so I encouraged him to start getting involved in Bible study, which he wasn't even in Sunday school at the time. Now, do you have to be in Sunday school to get called to preach? No. Do you have to go to seminary to be a preacher? No. But sometimes God gives you opportunities to do these things to bring you to the point to be most effective. And so I encouraged him to do that, and he lost faith in that, and he didn't want to preach anymore after about a month. It kind of went away. Now, I pray. I don't even know where he's at nowadays, but I pray that God has never put his hand, taken his hand off of him. And today I pray through study and through waiting on God that he is preaching. I hope he is. But I'm telling you, he didn't want to wait. Well, I want what I want. I want it now. <laughs> if we can't learn to wait, we can't grow spiritually. Now, all of us have that tendency inside. We want it right now. Well, I'll serve, but I don't want to commit to long-term anything. You know, I'll, and can I get personal here? Y'all just pick, if you got to, get your feet off the floor. I'm sorry, I'm just going to tell you like it is. Well, you know, I'll teach, but I don't want to teach long. I'll do it for a couple of months. I'll be on the praise team, but, you know, I don't want to play all the time because I got things, some weekends I want to be gone, blah, blah, blah. You know, we understand we got to rotate in and out sometimes. But listen, God is looking for people who will commit to doing ministry. Not when it's convenient. You, where would you be at today if Paul only went on a missionary journey when it was convenient? <clears throat> well, this nation wouldn't be Christian because what a Paul did went out into Asia, which went out into Europe, which came to America, which came to the Keel and the Pass and Diamond Head and Mississippi, and it's because of someone sacrificing long-term that you and I know Christ. Another social demand is that our culture says, do, don't do anything that compromises your comfort. Oh, well, you know, I'm not comfortable on Christmas Eve loading up on a bus and carrying bags to homeless people on Christmas Eve. That's where we're going Christmas Eve morning. We're going to New Orleans. And we're going to hand out bags. And some people say, and I've had them tell me this, and, and I'm so, well, I'll tell you the whole story. First of all, they told me, well, I'm not going down there with my children. I'm not carrying my children down there. And after they found out from the year before what it was like, they wanted their children to go. Because getting your children involved at a young age and doing ministry is sowing seed, kingdom seeds into them so that later when God calls them into ministries, they understand what the calling is and they understand what's on the line here. Sacrifice. How long will the mission trip take? You know, I've, I've only, I'm, I only want to take so many days on my vacation. I, can't, I don't want to take it all because I want to go do this or do that on my vacation. But I'll give the mission team a couple of days. Hmm. What will be the living conditions? I remember my first mission trip when I went to Honduras. I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning on my little cot with my air mattress and with ants all in my bed. That was not comfortable. And prior to that, before I realized I had ants about every three or four hours from one in the morning as those uh, guys were carrying their donkeys to the work fields, they would come by where we were sleeping and you hear the donkeys. Oh, oh. <clears throat> and that would wake you up. No, it gets worse. After I brush the ants off, it's time to take a shower. At 5 a.m., it's pitch black. You have one light bulb in a shower thing 
and it's basically a nozzle and boards around you with a door on it. You get the picture. And it's 5 o'clock in the morning, and it's about 50-something degrees. No, there's no heater in there. Don't ask me, did I turn the heater on? And you go in, and you turn the water on, and it's like ice. And so you kind of splash it on you a little bit, and when you do, it takes your breath away, it's so cold. Finally, you get up the, the courage to get into the water a little bit, soap up, just a little enough to get by, and get the water, rinse you off, and get out of there, amen? No, it's not comfortable. God doesn't always call you to be comfortable. You're very comfortable this morning, temperature's good, got nice lights, soft seats, we are so used to being comfortable. Paul was shipwrecked, persecuted, beaten, stoned, drug out, left for dead. I'm telling you, we haven't been there yet. Our culture says, you need to stay comfortable. What will be the living conditions? Well, I don't know what God calls you into. Well, here's another question. Well, you mean I won't have cell service? What about my iPad? You know... Ear bobs are, you know, what, what are they for? I can't wear them. I can't put my earplugs in and, and hear what my music. Oh, man. You know, it's going, if it's going to interfere with your schedule, sometimes you say, well, I can't do that. It's, I got other things. Listen, if you buy into this, it's going to cost you your calling from the Lord. A third message Satan wants us to accept is when our culture says, don't do anything that's not convenient. <clears throat> hmm. when is it ever convenient to give away what we have? That is, unless we're giving it to go buy something new. Reminds me of the first church I was at, and a guy, I, I told the church, I said, we need a TV cart, and we need a TV, you know, to roll around to classrooms and watch videos and stuff. And uh, we didn't have either, my first church. So I'm thinking TV card, yeah, cool, big TV, 25 inch. So I said, we need a 25 inch television, we need a nice card, put it on. <clears throat> well, one of the church members the next week called me and he says, I want you to come by the house, I want to give you, my, give you a TV stand, I got a TV stand for you. I said, great. I said, man, that's great. So, I mean, I, I'm a new preacher, I'd been preaching for what, two months, you know, something like that, I was green. And uh, so I go down to his house and, and he says, here it is. He had it sitting over to the side of his TV. He had a nice TV, a nice cart. He says, here it is. I've given it to the church for the Lord. I said, well, it kind of looks a little used. You know what I'm saying? I picked it up. One of the wheels fell off of it. So I had to get it and put it in my pocket, one of the little skinny plastic things. And, uh, and I, I brought it back and we used it. <clears throat> I said, don't try to pick nothing up here. You got to roll it. You can't pick it up. And uh, and I thought, wow, we give God our old used stuff that we don't want anymore. Well, there was another man in the church, and he come up, and he knocked on the office door that day. I was at the church, and he said, Pastor, he said, I got you a TV. <clears throat> I'm thinking, oh, brother, what's this one going to look like, you know? <laughs> Maybe it'll go with the cart. It'd be vintage TV. Um, and I said, well, wow, that's great. And he said, I need you to help me carry it in. The box is too heavy. Brand new, 25-inch, color TV, tabletop model, remote control. That was a long time ago. All right. And, you know, he brought it in, and I'm thinking, God, this guy took his own money and went out and bought this for the Lord's work and brought it in brand new, the best he could afford, and brought it to us. You see, there's a difference in giving God our junk and giving God our leftovers and giving God our best. Well, we're talking about it being convenient. We can make it convenient for ourselves uh, and just spend a few dollars or just give a, give a few dollars to the Lord. You see, someone told me, well, doesn't the Bible said God doesn't need our money? Of course he doesn't need your money. He owns everything. Why does he need anything from you? He doesn't need anything from you. What you need is him. And he is trying to teach you to be a giver. You understand what I'm saying? Self or sacrifice. He wants us to learn to be givers. People of the book are givers. 
Christians, according to Scripture, are givers. Well, I know the church needs workers, but that would mean I have to give up my time. I would have to come over here on a Friday or a Saturday and help build a baptistry thingamajigger out there. Y'all like that? There'll be ten on it eventually. Um, but it's coming along. It's really looking nice. I'm real pleased with what everybody's doing there and appreciate everybody that's coming and helping. And, um, and so <clears throat> it's not convenient. You know, I know that I have to stop. I had to cut my Friday off. I had things to do, and I said from... From noon to 5 o'clock, I'm coming to the church and help work on that thing. And several guys came. We had five or six guys out there working Friday. And I appreciate that. And I know everybody can't come. But everybody can do something. Every Christian should be involved in some aspect of ministry at Grace Chapel if you're here. Notice I didn't say anything about you being a member of Grace Chapel. I said, because it's not about being a member of Grace Chapel. It's about being, doing a ministry that belongs to the Lord. <clears throat> and so it's not always convenient. In fact, I dare say this. When God tells you to do something, when he calls you to do something, it's going to be out of your box. It's not going to be timely. It's going to cost you something. So get over it and get on board with God. Amen? Well, you know, we just give... We give excuse of time. I don't have the time. I don't have the talent. I don't have the money. You don't know my situation. You know, I didn't get a paycheck, blah, blah, blah. I don't know all that. God knows your heart, and that's what he's looking at. He's not looking at what you got in your pocketbook. He's looking at what your heart is. And you could, you could give $100 out of your pocket, and that'd be a lot of money for you, but have the wrong attitude about heart. He's looking at your heart. Let me say something else before someone runs with this one. <clears throat> you say, well, I, my heart is all for God, but I'm only giving $2 this week in the offering plate. Your heart is not all for God. Let me tell you something. When I give to God, I wish I could give more than what I'm actually giving. I wish I could. I wish I had it available. God's looking at your heart. And this thing about, uh, well, God loves a cheerful giver. You ever heard that one? So a person told me one time, I'm, you know, I'm, this tithing thing, I don't really go for believing the tithing thing, even though it's Old Testament. And Jesus said he even went beyond that. But he pulled the one scripture out, and it says, God loves a cheerful giver. <clears throat> and he does. He looks at the attitude of our hearts. But then... Somebody would tell me, well, I don't have to give but $5 a week because I'm doing it cheerfully. I, I don't know. I mean, people take the word of God and twist it. I'm telling you, you know what the Bible says that you're supposed to give. And God, looking at your heart, wants you to just want to give it all, want to give more than what you even can. And God honors that and he respects that and he will bless you. Let me say this. I don't, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about anything that you have that you give to God, he will bless. You got the right heart attitude, he's going to bless it. Did he bless the widow's might as she only had this one coin to drop in there? Yeah. He blessed her with that, for that. So God will bless us. So we're talking about be, things being convenient, and they're not always convenient. In fact, I dare say... When God calls you to do it, it's not going to be convenient. <clears throat> it's going to cost you to change something. So <clears throat> if you buy into this idea of everything should be convenient for you, you will not fulfill your calling that God has on your life. Our calling is on the opposite side of selfishness. You have to weigh what you want against what God wants. You have to decide to serve yourself or to be a living sacrifice unto God. Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 6. I want to read that. It says, While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came up with an alabaster jar, very expensive perfume in it, made of, of uh, some kind of stuff called nard. Doesn't sound good to me, but it must have been good. She broke the jar and poured the pure perfume on the head of Jesus. 
Now, you know Jesus didn't ride around in limos, right? <clears throat> and he walked. And to take this expensive jar of perfume that others said, well, you could have sold that, had a lot of money for ministry. What did Jesus say? She knows I'm not going to be here long. She is doing for me. Listen, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Look at Daniel. Look at the book of Revelation. And look at the signs of the times. We are not going to be here real long. And so we need to give whatever we can give to God right now because we're not going to have a second chance to do it. In verse 4 of that same chapter says, Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? If she had sold this, you could have got more than a year's wages and the money could have been given to the poor and they rebuked her. And Jesus said, Leave her alone. Let her give it. Because Jesus looked at that heart. It wasn't the perfume. It wasn't the, you know, the good smelling stuff. It wasn't even the value of it. He looked at that woman's heart. And he saw a heart that was ready to give it all, give the best to the Lord. Amen. Well, let me say that you can fulfill your calling if you're willing to sacrifice unto God. How often, and I'm, I'm speaking to myself along with you, how often do we simply give a token of what God blesses us with? How often do we just throw something at him? I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about time, talent, whatever it is. How often do we just give him a token? Well, I'm telling you, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. <clears throat> is anybody in here... Got found the fountain of youth or anything where you're staying there? No, didn't think. We're wasting away outwardly, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary for, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all of these other things. So fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and you're not going to have it anymore. But what is unseen is eternal. What does that tell us? God's saying, listen, you're only on this life for so many years. Now I want you to think about eternity past before you were born. Here's you. No, that's not you. There's eternity past and you're that dot. That's all you are. Your life. And then eternity future. And, and I want to ask you this. Are you willing to sacrifice during your dot for all of that, for all that God has for you for all eternity, are you willing to sacrifice all that so you can have it your way today? <clears throat> I think we need to come to grips with some things. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Not revealed to us, but revealed in us. That's Christ. If Paul is writing this. Do you realize that he's, he's been shipwrecked, beaten, and persecuted, and all of these things, and he's saying, listen, nothing I have experienced is even, doesn't even compare to what God has for me. Suspending daily sacrifices is Satan's goal. That goal then is for you not to be a daily sacrifice to God. That's what he wants. He can't have you but he wants you to quit sacrificing yourself for God. Same thing Antiochus IV Epiphanes did in the temple in his day. He suspended the Jews from coming in and offering daily sacrifices to God. That's what Satan wants in today's society where we live. He doesn't want you sacrificing anything. But God does. We have been called to be a drink offering, a living sacrifice, a people after God's own heart. And we've been called to be Daniels, men and women of integrity, living sacrificially every day for Jesus. Amen?